I want to start today's pod talking about the ring chasers. Maybe we'll throw a little Z on that for the kids. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking at dudes, forcing trades. Sometimes it's in free agency, and you're like, I don't like that. But some of them, we should be like, that's fine. That's totally cool. I don't have a problem with that. I went back 30 years. I looked at a lot of them. Did I look at all of them? There's probably a couple that I've missed, but I have an extensive list here, and I want to go through it and talk about some of the ring chasers and how that relates to Dame potentially going to Miami, because it still feels like Miami's probably going to get their way. It's just Portland's like, hey, it's July. I don't like the offer. We'll see what happens. Uh, I have some rules here. Rule number one is the player has to have some kind of stature, right? I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, two, the move has to be potentially annoying to someone. Not necessarily me, because a lot of these, they don't annoy me as I was going through and looking back at the history of the transaction. Uh, and rule number three is refer back to when I say I'll probably miss a couple because I go back 30 years. I have three categories. I want to start with the older guys. The older guys. We'll start with Shaq. Now, if you want to go the full Shaq timeline, when he went from Orlando at LA, he was just looking to build something. So that's nothing. Um, when he went from LA to Miami, let's take a look back at who he was because he was in some decline. Uh, he'd taken 14 shots per game that season, which actually was to that point of his 12-year career, the lowest uh, shot attempts per game that he had ever had. He was 31. And remember the Lakers, that was about kind of going into phase two of Kobe. Kobe was sick of Shaq. The Lakers having Shaq in-house weren't exactly sure they wanted to give him the $100 million extension. So they trade him and they move him out. By the way, Miami's like, we're cool with giving you $100 million, um, which should give you some reasoning into the Dame pursuit, being like, well, you don't care. We'll figure it out. And it worked out for Miami. Uh, he got the ring, but then he ended up in Phoenix after three and a half plus years in Miami. That wasn't ring chasing at all. Phoenix, that whole thing was kind of over at that point. And it didn't fit from a basketball standpoint at all. Seven seconds or less, or let's bring in aging Shaq. But that was new owner syndrome. Absolute 101. First day of that course. Uh, Robert Sarver being like, no, it's just cool to have Shaq. Uh, and he, I remember him going crazy on his court in his courtside seats. I remember being at ESPN that night, being like, "Wait, somebody actually traded for Shaq at this point?" And Phoenix did. Um, he had one year left on his deal when Phoenix sent him to Cleveland. There was a lot of hype for that, but really, that was just getting rid of the money because they traded him for Ben Wallace, who they waived, and Sasha Pavlovich, who they released later on in a second rounder. So Shaq gets to Cleveland. He's on the cover of Sports Illustrated with LeBron. It says, look out, I think. You know, there's a lot of hype because of the star power of it. From a basketball, most of us, most of you listening to this now are like, yeah, I don't know that I ever really took him all that seriously other than LeBron ascending into the best player in the world because Cleveland did lose to Boston in six, but Shaq was fifth in minutes for Cleveland in that series. Um, then he ended up in Boston in 2011. He played 12 total minutes in the playoffs for the Celtics during 2011. So uh, maybe some would consider that ring chasing towards the end. I really don't think it was all that egregious. And he started just kind of getting dumped because of some financial stuff. Let's stay with the Lakers here because Gary Payton's a good one. Uh, Gary Payton and Carl Malone teamed up in 03. That's right, 03, 04 season to go to the Lakers. Uh, Gary Payton had already been traded in Milwaukee in the Ray Allen deal. Uh, he signed a one-year deal for four. It actually, it was a two-year deal, but the first year of the deal was around $5 million. And he, in that disastrous series against Detroit, he had been really good, I thought, through much of the regular season. But that series for against Detroit, everybody's numbers, like just not what you'd expect or hope they would be. He had three and a half points per game against them. Did free agent sign with the Heat and then won his title. But to me, that's later, later stages. He took a massive pay cut. I think Portland was going to pay him like $10 million a year, and he took half to go to the Lakers. Speaking of pay cuts, Carl Malone, 18 years with Utah, signs with the Lakers that same season. Uh, it was Carl Malone's last season. He's 40, signs for one and a half million, by the way, had made 19 million a year before with Utah. He was hurt much of that season, missed actually one of the finals games. And I think he scored like 20 total points in that series. So uh, not egregious, kind of in that, as I said in the beginning, the older guy category. Let's continue. Zo, Alonzo Mourning. Remember, he was traded to Miami in that Glenn Rice deal. I'm not going to go through all that stuff. He signed with the Nets, but then was traded to Toronto. He never played a game for the Raptors. He was waived, gets back with the Heat in 05, wins with the second year with them, but then he was kind of done. So that was towards the end of the, his run. Um, Mitch Richmond, another Laker. Uh, he was 36, a six-time All-Star in his last season as an NBA free agent. So not exactly forcing trades here, as if you're paying attention. 
Uh, he played four and a half minutes total in the playoffs. <laughs> that might be one of those where he has a ring, but nobody ever puts him down as like, well, he's got a ring. Like, yeah, you got it. And I'm sure that was fun for him. But, and we don't exactly like spend a ton of time debating where Mitch Richmond is historically. But that's almost in its own category of like older guy that you're like, oh, that's right. He he does have a ring, but it changes nothing about the way I remember him because I forgot that he was even on those teams. Staying with that theme, Chris Weber, 33 years old, signs as a free agent with Detroit. He was kind of toast at that point. Uh, he had only played in half the games for Detroit, and he ended up retiring a year later. David West, 36, goes to Golden State, two rings. He timed that right, 17 and 18. We go Nash, L.A. with that, that group there where it was like the four dudes. They were all going to show up. Well, Nash, at that point, he was 38, 39 the last two seasons with the Lakers. Uh, he had missed 20 games in his last season with Phoenix. You could just see the declining numbers. Um, he only played in 15 games in his last season there. But again, this wasn't the, the headline forcing. Now, let's get to the questionable category. This group is the one that may have some moves that could annoy you a bit. But let's go through it and see how we feel about it years removed. Michael Finley, he left Dallas for San Antonio at 32 years old. Okay, but he was actually waived using the amnesty provision. He was owed $52 million, 51.8, if you're keeping track on the luxury tax. So Dallas saved a ton of money by waiving him with the amnesty on the tax bill. So even though you look back and be like, man, Finley went to San Antonio, won a title in 2007, Dallas waived him just for the tax savings. So that's not like forcing in the hand. That's not demanding anything. He wanted to stay. Dallas wanted to keep him. But then San Antonio completely benefited because they didn't have to pay him all that much because he still made all that money. So you could say it annoyed you if you were, let's say, a Dallas fan by watching it happen. But you got to side with the player on that one. What about Clyde Drexler? Let's go back to his Portland days. Portland had traded Kevin Duckworth and Clyde says that Portland said he wanted re- they wanted to rebuild, and he was like, I want to relocate. Uh, he asked to be traded. He goes to Houston, who had already won a title in 94. Uh, in the finals for Houston, he averaged 22, 10, and 7. Big time numbers for a guard uh, like Clyde. He gets his long awaited ring that feels like it's a more defining one and feels a bit more ring chasey er. But with Portland at that point, how about this crazy number, too? Um, in his career, he made twenty-one million dollars of his career. He made of so he made thirty-one million for his career. Twenty-one million of it was with the three years that he was with Houston. So two-thirds of his earnings were in those three years with Houston, on top of everything else, which is pretty crazy. But if the Clyde one happens today, we might give him more shit for it. All right, another one that at least can be questioned. Ray Allen leaving the Celtics for the Miami Heat. Uh, The weird one with this one is that he went to Miami for less money, like significantly less. It was like three years, nine million, where Boston apparently offered two years and 12 million. Um, Miami had already won their first title with LeBron, Wade, and Bosh. There's certainly a Boston element to it of like, wait, Boston's still trying to fight with Miami to get out of the East, and then you decide to go there, and you go there for less money. Um, I never really had as much of an issue with it at the time, and I also thought that the Ray Allen Rondo stuff, and there was a real disconnect there, and that Ray Allen was going to be somebody who was going to be more of a specialist at that point, and that he went to Miami. You know, I just felt like he was timing it right as the Boston thing. They weren't going to play in a finals series again. Uh, they didn't. They had that weird series with Miami where they went up on them, but I still didn't think Miami was going to lose that series. Uh, another one, Chris Paul to Houston. If you go back to 2017, everybody thought Paul was going to be re-signing with the Clippers, but this one was really financially based. Now, Chris Paul was 32. Uh, the Clippers thing had run its course due to Paul's injuries in the playoffs and then Blake's injuries. You go back through all those playoff series, you're like, wait, what did the Clippers do? They just couldn't get out of their own way because one of the two guys always seemed to get hurt. Houston had won 55 games the year before, but had lost in the second round. But there was a $200 million extension that Paul wanted, but there was hesitation if you go back and look at the reporting saying that they didn't want to give him that fifth year, which, you know, I understand. The Rockets were like, we'll do it. Um, So he opts in, forces the trade to Houston. They win 
way more games and they give him after that final year, they give him a four year, $160 million extension uh, the next summer. Because remember, he was a free agent. You were like, wait, are they going to do this deal and only have him for a year? That was not the case. So he still ended up making close to the 200 million that they originally wanted. By the way, that contract was like massively, massively backloaded, which is another reason why the price was so high to move him at the time. But people thought he was going to be declining, goes to Oklahoma City. That's a whole different story. That one felt way more about just making sure he could maximize those five years of earning power than it was where Houston's this loaded team. I want to go there already. Uh, another one that's at least questionable is Kevin Garnett out of Minnesota. The package back for Kevin Garnett was pretty bad. The fact that McHale couldn't get Rondo out of that one on top of everything else, it was pre, here's a million picks. Al Jefferson's a nice player. Uh, Garnett, though, at that point, like if you want to look at it from the Boston side of it, they were actually tanking. So it wasn't like they were loaded. But then, then they had added Ray Allen. They were also tanking by sitting Paul Pierce, like one of the only stretches that Pierce had missed time in his career with Boston. The Garnett rumors had gone on for like three years. And then originally, once it was getting close, he didn't even want to go to Boston. He wanted to go to Phoenix. But then Boston said, we're going to give you a three-year extension on top of the two remaining years. And that made him a lot happier. So that one could be, that one's probably a little bit more on the, hey, question it. I'm sure it annoyed the hell out of Minnesota fans, especially when the package back didn't seem like it was as competitive as something else. But look, Phoenix could have found a way to do it. They didn't. And then Boston made sure the extension was going to be fine. What about Pau Gasol? Now, the history on this one's a little iffy. If you go back, he was 27, man. He was in his prime. The Lakers had only 42 and 40 the previous year. They lost to Phoenix in the first round. Uh, The trade was super controversial for a couple different reasons. One version of the story goes that uh, Michael Heisley, the owner at that point, told Chris Wallace that he wanted to trade Gasol instead of extending him because it made the team more desirable for the next owner, which is something I never understand. I actually don't believe it. I don't think it's true. It's brought up all the time where it's like, oh, well, the owner's trying to sell this team, so he wants to lower payroll. And it's like, actually, isn't the team way more valuable? Look at some of the Fours uh, valuations of NBA teams and how different they are when a star is there, when the star leaves. So I've never believed that. And Gasol at that point is terrific 27. The other thing that was controversial about that trade uh, Popovich even said that it should have been voted down. He said there should be a committee to oversee trades and vote these things down. Of course, if something works out for him, I'm sure he doesn't hate it as much. But the reason people were really pissed around the league is they felt like Gasol actually wasn't really offered and that it just was a straight up Memphis hooking up the Lakers um, because of the Chris Wallace, Jerry West relationship. Um, do with that what you will. I remember when the trade happened and it was when I was first starting to talk to teams pretty regularly. Other teams were like, we didn't even know he's available. Like, you've got to be kidding me. And it was the best thing that could have ever happened to Kobe Bryant because they were a completely different team after the fact. Now, did Gasol ask to be traded? Um, some people say yes, and that he was de- he was demanding the trade. The other side of it is if he had just gotten the extension, he would have been happy to stay there and all that stuff. But it worked out basically for everybody because Mark Gasol, who none of us thought were ever going to be any good, and I'm still shocked that he was this good considering what he was in a prospect, as a throw-in into the trade, uh, what he ended up turning into. But I don't know that that was as forceful as some of the more modern stuff that we're used to. All right. Um, Charles Barkley. Got to bring it up. Because if you're a newer player and you're watching Barkley diss you on TNT for trying to get your way all the time, uh, you have pretty good ammo when Barkley decided that he wanted to leave Phoenix. The Philly one, the place was a mess by the time he wanted to go to Phoenix. So that one doesn't bother me as much. But Barkley's saying, all right, Houston's won a couple titles. I've lost to him in the playoffs. Um, maybe I'll just go to Houston and then it just didn't work out. Um, and then he ended up getting hurt and pretty soon after that retiring towards the end, that one at least is in the questionable category. Other ones that could be questionable, but are in their own different subcategory off of this, the big three in Miami, it's definitely ring chasing. It's definitely coordinated. It's totally different than the one guy demanding to go to somewhere else. And, you know, sometimes you go, hey, free agents decided to get together and just did it. People hated it in 2010. If it happened now, I don't know that it would be treated with the same harshness. There is a way that we become desensitized to stuff that just happens over time, just like anything in life. Same thing with NBA transactions. We're like, oh, that's not the greatest. Same thing like with the way you parent your kids. Like the first kid you're going like, I don't think I want you watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles because of the violence. And then your third kid, you're like, hey, do you want to watch Porky's again? right? It happens. You become desensitized to it. However, if you look at the Heat 3, the Nets 3, because you could also throw Kawhi and Paul George going to the Clippers kind of in this subcategory, 
if the Nets three or Heat three doesn't really bother you, then the Kawhi Paul George thing should never bother you. That's fair. I'm not even sure what the Nets thing is. I don't know if Harden belongs to even be brought up in the ring chasing with this because when he was leaving Houston, he was definitely ring chasing to go to Brooklyn. And when he was leaving Brooklyn, he was ring chasing to get to Philly. But I guess it doesn't feel as egregious because on the way out, it seemed like both teams were like, good, let's get this guy out of here. The Heat three part of it, I guess I would say this, is if Jokic, Giannis, and Doncic all decided to align their free agencies coming up here in a year or two, and then all sign with the same team, would it be like, hey, this is awesome? Or would we be like, that kind of sucks? And I think I get it. I think I get why people would be like, it kind of sucks, even if it's their right to go and do it, just like the dudes did in Miami over a decade ago. Uh, Yeah, I think it'd be okay to say, hey, this kind of sucks. And the reason why most fans would be saying it kind of sucks, because then you'd be like, wait, this might be really hard to beat this team, and it's going to cost my own happiness because my team's going to have a tougher challenge. So the last category is tougher to defend. And it's a good transition here because the Durant stuff is just tough for a guy who likes Durant as much as I do. I don't think there's anything worse in 30 years of forcing your way to ring chase than him going to Golden State. It just isn't. It didn't bother me as much at the time. And oddly enough, it bothers me more in retrospect because I just get it. I get why nobody liked it. I think I defended it because I just was happy for him to get away from Westbrook. I think he wanted basketball happiness. And I don't think there's a lot of basketball happiness when you're arguably like flirting with being the best player in the world and Westbrook plays the way that he does. So I was rooting for that. I know that he said that when the Warriors lost in 16, blowing the 3-1 lead against Cleveland, that opened the door for him to do it. I'd heard so much about him going to Golden State prior that I just, I don't know that I even believe it. I think it's a very convenient thing to say, and it derails the idea that he just wanted out of Oklahoma City. Some people disagree with me. I'm not sure who's right with it. But you add that to the Nets ring chase, which, again, I don't have that big of a problem with, to then, hey, I'm going to go to Phoenix and only Phoenix after I wanted to force a trade out this summer, then came back, then played, then got hurt. And you know what? Now that Kyrie's out, I want out too. As a Durant fan, it's probably the worst of any of the scenarios that I'm going to throw at you. The last one I have for you is for our man Saruti, Dwight Howard, Orlando Magic. This thing was so fucking dumb. I remember doing the daily radio shows. It was like a daily update topic there for a little while. You had Stan telling the, <laughs> the assembled media that Dwight wanted him out. Dwight comes over like, hey, what are you talking about? And it's like Stan just letting it fly and Dwight having like, he is an extra laying of awkward, you know, like a cake with extra frosting on the top. Dwight finds a way to add this extra layer of awkward to the whole thing. And then to put it all to bed, he opted in to the last year of the deal. And then was reading the quotes. I could have gone all day on this. He had one quote where he's like, loyalty is the most important thing to me. And then guess what? It was not the most important thing. So after opting in to show everybody that he was cool with it, then he wanted his trade. He gets his trade to LA at 26. Then you've got the deal where he lasts a year there because Kobe's like, wait, this is not the dude. And then, you know, Dwight has a few transactions later on. I don't know where Dame would hold up here um, historically for this stuff. You know, Max Guy got every dollar, did the extra extension, only wants to go to one team, uh, wanting to go to a team that was already in the NBA Finals because part of the the equation of this is feeling like, is this guy going to a team that's already loaded? Uh, we seem to have less of a problem with the guy that's already there than the guy that's showing up. But this is this is closer to the tougher defend category uh, than it would be to just an older player trying to find his way. 